The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit of the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All right, open the word of truth to Romans 8, where we're working on verses 35 and following. All right, let's take the customary time to uh, get ourselves under the filling ministry of God the Holy Spirit if we're not already there and otherwise disposed to focus our attention exclusively on this information. We are told to put aside uh, the sin nature, put aside personal concerns and problems. They will take care of themselves. God will work it out for you. You're here to concentrate on the information before us this evening. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you that as believers in Jesus Christ, we are secure in Christ, that your plan is perfect, and that you are providing for us the necessary information so that we can negotiate our way through time as we move towards the upward call. Bless this information to our spiritual edification and growth in Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. All right, verse 35, who will separate us from the love of Christ? And then Paul gives a listing of things that are general and specific in this seven item list. Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But we have a strong adversative and a strong contrast. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. We noted that we have a verb here, overwhelmingly conquer or are overwhelmingly victorious. This compound only occurs at this place in the New Testament, and uh, it refers to ultimate deliverance. Uh, in this analysis, number six, peril, that's, it's 29. The reason this is like this, like it's boring, but when you do a new analysis, you have to reset, restart the numbering and for, for a reason not to be specified. This didn't happen. And so point 17 is following 16 of the previous analysis. It was an oversight, that's all. <clears throat> uh, we'll uh, 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 and I'm just gonna go by these numbers since it's too confusing to re rewrite all this. 28, famine or extreme deprivation of food cannot undermine our so great salvation. Number six, peril, refers to a variety of dangers. And 2 Corinthians eleven twenty six is the only other use of this term. The last word, sword, refers to crime and warfare. Hebrews 11, this chapter, Hebrews 11, as many of you are well aware, this chapter in the New Testament is a catalog of the Old Testament crowd. Uh, obviously, it's a selected list. Everybody that did great isn't mentioned in the list. But this is a listing of the heroes of the faith, what I call the uh, spiritual hall of fame. These all, and, the, and the, one of the key words in, the, in this is they all found approval in a whole variety of situations that they were, that they faced. 
They, it, it, it varies. It's widely different in different respects. This, this uh, is really a fun chapter because it gives you an insight into these different believers and what they faced in time and what they overcame with Bible doctrine. Or, as it says here, also called the faith chapter, by faith, so-and-so did or didn't do something. By faith, faith is used in the active sense. That in the, in the midst of various things, they rose to the occasion. God prepared them for that moment. They were ready for it, and they didn't implode. They worked their way right on through whatever it was, whatever the challenge, whatever the test. These are the heroes of the faith, men and women. And you can read it, and uh, we have reviewed uh, these individuals. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Starting with the first one that was a standout. Uh, the younger, uh, the, the second son of Adam and Eve, Abel. And, he took, and his life was taken by his older brother Cain, murdered him. But Abel did, Abel did what he was supposed to do. He offered up the right kind of a sacrifice in the primitive, I don't mean in a bad way, the primitive worship system that they had in the Garden of Eden. Uh, where uh, you brought an animal sacrifice and fire came down out of heaven and consumed it right before your eyes. Cain was arrogant. He was the older. He was arrogant. He thought he could bring, he was a farmer, no problem with that. Uh, he thought he could bring some really nice looking produce from his farming and he had seen all his life what Adam and, his, and, and Eve brought and God accepted it. The fire out of heaven indicated God accepted the sacrifice. The sacrifice obviously is a, is, is a type of the type of the future coming of Christ who is our sacrifice. And fire indicates judgment. And the animal sacrifice was completely consumed. The animal was dead when it happened but the animal was bled out, boom, fire came down. And Cain saw this from a child. When he got old enough to offer his own sacrifice, he decided he was gonna do it different. And he was arrogant enough to think God would accept it. But when he offered up all these vegetables and fruit, which indicates good works, by the way, no fire came down out of heaven. That angered him. He got under extreme anger. And the long story short, he uh, sabotaged his brother one day because God accepted, God's no respecter of persons, God accepted Abel because it was the right sacrifice. So Cain thinks, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take him out. And he did. God permitted him uh, uh, to do that, <clears throat> murdering, the first human murder over a religious principle. And uh, an understatement is made. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice. Another key word throughout the book of Hebrews is better, better, better than. Well, obviously it was better than completely. It wasn't that Cain's was sort of okay. He offered a better sacrifice. Then Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous, God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. And these, and these all go through this, this pattern of different situations. Here at the end, towards the end of the chapter, we have uh, the author of this chapter 
has to wrap this up. And some of them, he only mentions by name. He doesn't say what they did by faith. He just lists them uh, honorary listing. What more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouth, mouths of lions. Well, that has to be Daniel, who was thrown into the lion's den under the Persian rule because he wouldn't comply with something that would have put him in violation of God's plan. He was a government official in both the Babylonian kingdom and it fell to the Persian kingdom and, and Daniel transitioned right over into it. When he came into Babylon, he was, he was a very young man. He had a long career. There's a whole book that he wrote, Daniel. He, he, is, he, he was taken from his homeland as an exile. And because he was from a certain family, a certain, within Israel, he was taken into, into, into Nebuchadnezzar's court and he was brought up in Nebuchadnezzar's college to learn all these things and to serve. And he did this faithfully through the reign of Nebuchadnezzar and through his pathetic successor. And he was there the night that the kingdom was overthrown by the Persians. He, he announced it. because nobody could understand this handwriting on a wall. They were having a big party, food and drink and party, and they took the vessels from the temple that had been plundered and they were offering toast to their gods. That was an affront. Daniel, in the, at the end of the Babylonian, he was a persona non grata. He, but when this, in the midst of this raucous party of the elite of Babylon, a hand appeared on a wall and carved right into it that deal you can read in Daniel. And it sobered everybody up real quick. The party's over. And nobody could, nobody could interpret it. They, and so the queen mother of the previous said, she was from the previous, said, there, there, there's Daniel. He comes in there. And the final king of Babylon wants to give him gifts and everything. He said, I don't want him. And he interpreted that that very night, the, their kingdom would be transitioned to the Persians. Without a big warfare, the Persians snuck in. They diverted the Tigris, the Euphrates River, which ran right through Babylon. They diverted it just enough that these commandos got in there and they killed everybody in that party house. Daniel walked out. During the Persian reign, he had a test. He had uh, the test of... Uh, being, th being thrown in a lion's den. These were hungry lions, but they did what lions don't do. They were docile. He spent the night with them. <laughs> he spent the night with all these very hungry lions, what would normally tore a person apart. And the Persian ruler, he was quite impressed. God has a way of impressing people with his people who do the right thing. He shut the mouth of lions. God did something. There's a whole bunch of miracles in the Bible about God overruling the natural activity of animals to do something unusual. And this was one big example. His ministry wasn't over, so he wasn't going to die by lions. Shut the mouth of lions. He had to throw that in. Quench the power of fire. That backs up to his, to his Meshach, 
and Abednego, the three friends of his that were also brought in as exiles. They would not fall down and worship the image that Nebuchadnezzar sat up. Daniel wasn't required of it. So they put him in an industrial furnace. Fire. Three of them. Daniel's three friends. And the flames didn't hurt him. And Nebuchadnezzar got close enough that he said, hey, there's four people in here. We put three in, there's four. The other one was the theophany of the Lord who was walking and talking with him. They tied him, in, they tied him into these ropes too. Threw him in there. They came out. The ropes, the only thing was burned was the ropes so they could move their arms and everything. And they came out and they said, the smell of smoke isn't even on them. So that's a big time miracle. God vindicated that. See, you're talking about a mighty pagan monarch that's proud of himself and his accomplishments and he's, he's got all the power and he gets to see something. The peop, people of God, uh, that, that group that was brought into captivity, escaped the edge of the sword from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection and others were tortured. Now we go to that other side of things. Not accepting, not accepting their release. In other words, they were being tortured to give up their faith. We'll let you go. You can walk clean uh, and we'll leave you alone if you will just deny your faith. They said, no. And the reason they did not accept the terms of their release, because obviously it would violate the direct will of God, is what was in their soul. So they might obtain a better resurrection. What's better than resurrection? Resurrection, with what we would say today, is the high reward of the crown. That's the better resurrection. Resurrection by itself is great, but the better resurrection. They knew that they would forfeit eternal reward. And others experienced mockings and scourgings. Yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. That is a reference to the great prophet Isaiah of all people. They cut him in half with a big saw. They were, put, they, were, they were put to death with a sword. They went about in sheepskins, in goatskins. There's your Ill, Ill clothing. Being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated. This, uh, this would occur during the intertestament period, during the Maccabean period, between the testaments, during the Greek oppression. And then the Bible says, and he says in parenthesis, men of whom the world is not worthy. You're not worthy to have these people in your presence. Wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. And all these, all going way back to the beginning of the chapter, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised. The resurrection body with the, with the rewards. They've got to wait to the second advent. Seven years after we get our final evaluation and our resurrection. Because God has provided something better for us, church age crowd, so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. We step ahead in the line. Even though we came later historically, we get to go and be taken out of here first. And the Old Testament crowd, they will be resurrected at the second advent. In verse 36, Paul quotes Psalm 4422 from the Greek version. That's the Roman, that's the, that's the, the numeral 70, LXX. To establish the fact that Jewish believers faced external threats throughout their long history. 32, and of course, the force behind these threats came ultimately from the evil one. 
the statement in that verse, we are, we like Israel, are under the constant hatred of Satan, the God of this world. But as Jesus Christ said of the church through its, through its long history, the gates of hell will not prevail against you. The gates of hell is an idiomatic expression for people who go through a certain passageway when they die on their way to hell. It's called the gates of hell. People go to hell through a passageway. I think I know, uh, I think I came across where it is in Job. I can't cite the verse right now. In other words, they just don't go there willy-nilly from all directions and angles. They could, but they don't. They go through a passageway. When you go through gates, you enter a specific spot, and the gate is the opening to get into wherever you're going. That's simple. It's a literal place and passageway. The gates of hell. And those who go to hell go through the gates. That simple. And of course, the, the force behind all these threats comes from the evil one. 34, we are viewed by the satanic forces as sheep to be slaughtered. They want to kill us. And they would if they were given free reign, but they're not. Yes, but some believers are, are go, through, go through dying as a result of the evil that's out there. Many Christians in the world today are being persecuted in various degrees and levels. Satan and his crowd hates anything referencing the church, even the, the ones that aren't squared away, and there's a lot of them. Satan's man, the Antichrist, will take out the Catholic Church in Europe. Because the Antichrist will have this picture, I, I don't allow any other religion. I am God. And so God uses him to take down the Catholic Church. You read all about it in Revelation 17. They're going to get it. That evil organization. That'll probably get me off YouTube too. But it's in Revelation 17. Every moment of every day, we are targets of this murderous hatred. Paul applies this verse to church age believers. They hated Jesus while on earth. There was an antagonism towards him, not just by the Jews, but the general posture of the world is antagonistic to and what Jesus Christ is. John 15, 18 reads, If the world hates you, and it does, why do they hate you? Because you represent something that, that they don't like. They're antagonistic to truth. Oh yeah, some people are whatever you want to do. But, they, but it's still a type of antagonism. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. You're in good company. If the world doesn't hate you and loves you and everything, it's because you've compromised the truth and you're a friend of the world. A person is known by their friends. <clears throat> In 1 John 3, 13. John, writing to these believers, says, Do not be surprised, brothers, brethren, if the world hates you. In verse 37, we have the striking contrast between the threats, these things, against us and our security under God's plan, our well-being, our ultimate well-being. The objective of our adversaries is completely negated, contrary to appearances. Whatever they do or are allowed to do to us does not overthrow anything God has promised for us. A blessed future and a resurrection body, we are victors in Christ. Exploit it by being, staying positive. 
We are above and beyond conquerors over the cosmos and the God of this world. Uh, I, I skipped one. Jesus' victory over his enemies included death, including death, will be ours in phase three. Jesus arose from the grave victorious over his foes. They didn't stop any of it. And so we, likewise, are victors. Paul employs a hopox, that means occurs once, translated overwhelmingly conquer. God's love for us is immutable, unchanging, as is all of his attributes. It's one of his attributes. He is immutable. And God vindicates and eternally protects that which he loves. He's going to take care of his children and provide for them what he has promised to provide them with. If you love someone, you protect that person. All believers will share in this victory over the forces of evil. The victory is so complete and total, it isn't even funny. Nobody's going to be complaining about what they had to go through or how they were persecuted or how they were treated. It takes on a lot of forms. It will be even sweeter for those who have held fast to Bible doctrine in the face of sufferings and threats. If you can manage to hang in here, you're here tonight. You can, you can, you, if you can manage to stay the course, you'll go through things, adversities. You're not above Jesus. None of us are. He's the pattern. And as I read in Hebrews, we have all these examples. Everyone didn't. Some believers, they were victorious in time over things over lions and fire and other things. Others suffered torture, imprisonment, confiscation of their property, <clears throat> and martyrdom. Okay. If that's the path that a believer has to go down, then go down it. Go through it. It's not your choice. Your choice is to stay positive, stay on doctrine, until we're out of here. All right, moving on. I just entitled this Inseparable, these last two verses of this chapter. Paul personally says, For I am convinced. For I am persuaded or convinced. <clears throat> Perfect active indicative of pytho means to persuade or be convinced of something. That, and then we have a series of conjunctions translated neither or nor. Neither death, that's physical death, thanatos, nor life, zoe, nor angels, nor principalities. The word is arche, it's a plural noun. In some context, it means the beginning or the first of something. Here it refers to whatever principalities are nor things present. The perfect participle of enis, Amy, means something that is impending. Translated, things present. Nor things about to be. Present participle, the verb mellow, means to be about. Here translated, nor things to come, future stuff. Nor dunamis, powers. Then he goes spatial, nor height. <clears throat> Hupsoma, nor depth, bathos. Nor, and finally, any other created entity. Nor any other, heteros, other of the same kind. Ketesis is a noun which means creature or what is created will be able to separate us, eris infinitive, be able, oh, be able is the future indicative of dunamai, be able to, there's corizo again, to separate us, we're back to that again, the love of God. 
the love of God, his attribute of love, which, definite article, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. All right. Paul continues the topic of eternal security and here presents it as his personal conviction. As we grow in doctrine, we deepen our convictions or put another way, we become more confident. It's not arrogant. We're just confident. You probably do things in life and you know what, you know what works and what doesn't work. And you've done it over and, and, you, and you know that that's, that's the way to go. Not that you're not open to any more insights. It's just that you know this is how you make this happen. He presents it here, in this case, as his own personal conviction. For I am convinced refers to Paul's inner confidence with regard to the security of his salvation. He personally, I am, I am 100% persuaded and convinced that this plan and this salvation is irrevocable, perfect, and cannot be overturned by anything one could imagine. He, over the years, gained complete confidence that nothing could separate him from union with Christ. This confidence was with him to the end of his life. Obviously, under the circumstances of his departure from the earth through martyrdom. That was God's plan for him. He says, for this reason, I also suffer these things, but I'm not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed. And I, and, I, and, I, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Two things are involved in that verse. The first is his security and salvation. And secondly, his SG3 account. Like salvation, once you gain a unit of SG3 through application of doctrine, it cannot be overturned. That's permanent too. That's another thing that cannot be revoked. Even if the believer goes astray spiritually and doesn't make a spiritual recovery. <clears throat> and uh, that's uh, made clear in. Hebrews as well, that God is not so unrighteous as to forget your divine good production, Reading to, writing to these Hebrew Christians who were, a, a number of them, uh, suffering spiritual lapse, lethargy, soul fainting. He says, remember the former days and how you excelled in the face of adversity? when you became believers and Jewish believers in Israel, in the nation, and how you clung to this in the spite of all that, God is not so unrighteous as to forget all that divine good production you produced back then when you were under the gun. Anyway, so this confidence was with Paul to the end of his life and sustained him through his considerable sufferings. You, that's another thing you keep in front of you in the midst of your adversities. And that is the fact that you're building up your SG3 account. And it's also making you a stronger believer. I got through that one. Experiences like this cause you to be a stronger believer, a better believer, and advance advanced forward spiritually for the long haul, the endurance to the end. And remember the promise. He will never put anything on any of you that you can't handle. If it's on you, you can handle it. It may push you to the edge, but you're not going to have something dumped on you that you can't handle. Normal people in life don't do that to people. Even if they ask them to go through some kind of a rigorous series of things. 
The nature of salvation with its promise of eternal life based solely on faith in Christ cannot be overturned by any external threat or entity. You've got it. It's yours. Even if you think differently, it doesn't matter. That's just you're being, you, you drop the ball on that. You've got to have security with regard to your salvation. There's so many out there that are confused by this, teach false doctrine about this, tell believers they can lose it. I've had people come in here and we're so grateful. One person in particular told me, the night I came, you were teaching and reviewing the doctrine of eternal security. And I was in a denomination that said you could lose your salvation. Oh, I know. That's it. That one's right in the neighborhood here. That you, and they may be vague about it, but what, what, what do I have to do to lose my salvation? Just any old sin? See, it's a nonsense. And they're the same ones that teach that you can reach sinless perfection. It just magically, mystically happens at some point in your life. And you'll never sin again as a believer. And it flies right in the face of 1 John. If anyone says this, he's a liar and the truth isn't in him. <clears throat> he lists 10 things that cannot separate believers in Jesus Christ for, from their standing as children of God. 7. He expresses this security as the love of God. That is the love which the father has for his own. A good father takes care of his own, provides security for them, different types. God loves us with the same love he has for his son. And look what he's done for him and is going to do for him. Same love directed towards all who are believers. Since the Father and the Son are inseparable, and we are in union with the Son, we are as secure as the Son is, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> People in the world are trying to find security, trying to find something, if something happens, that they'll, they'll be protected. I get these emails. Something's coming. Yeah, I know something's coming. You bet it is. But you don't have enough money for this. There isn't enough money. There's not no. Uh, there's no places you can go and ride this out in some doomsday bunker. I don't care how many billions you've got. You're you're exposed. You may be able to survive a little bit on something, but no. Someone just built another compound, a secure compound. What's going on? I got this email. Because they're stirring everybody up. Oh yeah, they want you to invest in this tech or this currency and how much money you can make with it. It's ridiculous. That's all they've got. They're not secure. I'm in Christ. I'm secure. God will provide me with everything I need. And if he asks me to go through something really difficult te test-wise, then he's going to take care of me. And I'm going to soldier up and go through it. But there's all, there's all this out there. Uh, and, they're trying to, and they're trying to work us up in the cosmos, get us frightened, get us worrying about a virus, a war. What's happening in the Ukraine? It was going to happen today, right? They're putting this out like the gospel. So I don't know how much of this stuff is just made up to keep everybody wrapped around the axle. Free yourself from it. Jesus Christ controls history. Not Russia, not anybody. But they've got to be wrapped up about it, don't they? Since God's love is backed up by his omnipotence, we are inseparable no matter the nature of external threats. 
The listing here mentions 10 items that we potentially face. Someone could add other things to the list, but you've got to end it somewhere. Death here refers to physical death, however the person dies. Of believers, which millions and millions of them have died before us, which results when the soul and spirit exits the body and goes immediately into the presence of God. The body without the spirit is dead. Your soul was plugged into your body when you took your first breath of air out from the womb. First breath of air, a miracle occurred. Your soul was created. And when you die, your soul exits. And because you're saved, it goes directly into the presence of the Lord, the third heaven above. Death, not something else you might think, physical death, is the last enemy that will be abolished. Death is an enemy. It, it, it came on the scene with the fall of man and been with us ever since and claimed untold billions and billions of people through history. So, it is the last enemy, not Satan. Satan will be cast into the lake of fire after the Gog and Magog event. Death will be the, and then right after that on the new earth, those that still have the death gene will take the elixir, the leaves of the tree, and it will reverse aging, negated. I mean, if someone is 30, or if someone's 90, they will be reset. Reset. They're working on this out in the cosmos, trying to figure out what causes aging. It's, it's biological. It's physiological. It's genetic. They think they can figure out the key to it, to override it. Well, obviously, they're just talking about the, the, the aging factor that claims people's lives. You could live to be 100 and you die of old age. They want to reset all that. Well, God's going to reset it at the, at, at the coming of the Lord. I think of a verse, and I'll let you go. I'll think of a, I think of a verse dealing with the Tower of Babel. Let us go down, the Trinity... Let us go down and see what they're doing. Because if they stay like they are, because God's plan was for them to spread out and form these nations, if they stay all there and pool all their intellectual abilities, there's nothing they can't do, hardly. And this is the same thing that's going on today, the pooling of these different people doing different studies in different institutions. And now, because of the Internet and all this, you get this, get this rapid information. You know, the bad side of technology. Because they want us all to be controlled, as in transhuman. That's what they want. They don't like volition. <laughs> it messes up their party. And that's what the mark of the beast will be about. Somehow, it'll overrule the volition of the dummies that take it. That's all I can figure because there's nothing that a, that a, that a person out here can, can do and not get saved if they decide to. They could, they, could take a, they, could, they could take a satanic initiation, be a Satanist, be wrapped up in all this business, and turn away from it and believe. There's examples of that, of that extreme type of person. But those who take the mark can't be saved. It isn't like God, you know, it isn't, some, it isn't a tattoo I can, I can only imagine what people would have thought back in the day before this technology came on. And then there's the technology related to the image of the beast. As I told you, I saw a thing where they had a, 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 a news broadcaster out of China. And they said, this thing we made looks just like him and you'll be hard-pressed to tell him apart. And 
the image set up in the, in, the, in the temple, in the trib, will be a mirror image of Alexander. But it'll be a machine. I don't know what all goes into it. They're doing all kinds of stuff. Combining physical and that parts of a, a person's body with all of this. Just, just for your information. Oh, I was going to bring my phone up here. I didn't. Israel 365 News. There's four, earthqu four earthquakes in Israel within a short period of time, and two of them occurred over 10 days. They're not big ones. Three point. And all that is up and down that valley that starts in Lebanon and runs all the way through the Jordan River, all the way through the Dead Sea area, and goes all the way to Mozambique. It's called the Great Rift Valley, and it's a hotbed for earthquakes. And there's going to be some really big earthquakes. In the tribulation, of course, <laughs> say the least, there'll be an ultimate superquake, the ultimate superquake, worldwide. It'll knock all the mountains down. Whoa. That's just, and uh, so forth. So uh, I saw that one. Uh, the Jews also have their... Uh, Truckers convoy going on. Just for just little news items. Look at that 365. They talk about that the, the coming of the Messiah is imminent. But they don't ever tell me who he is. So they got some idea of a Messiah. And they quote Old Testament and mess it up here and there. But uh, uh, you can read there's there's some things there, there's things that are stupid, of course. Uh, 365 Israel News or Israel, Israel 365, something like that. And uh, that, that convoy, they said truckers and cars and motorcycles are coming from all the villages in Israel and converging on Jerusalem because they're fed up with this. They're fed up with it. There's a breaking point. Just interesting stuff going on in the world. And then they'll have articles on some of the technologies Israel's developing. Really phenomenal stuff. And other stuff that's just, you know, we're going to make better basil. Best you ever saw. All natural. So they're, they, they're doing a lot of things in Israel. It's phenomenal. And then the last one, I'll let you go, I promise this time. <laughs> Pelosi said, the development of Israel is the greatest achievement in the 20th century. You know, I can't quite argue with that. It's the greatest development in the 20th century. The state of Israel, the, the nation. Then she went on to say that they need to divide the land up with their enemy, with, their, with, the, with the others. Of course. There's a verse, I haven't found it. I, uh, God, is not, God does not like those that divide up my land. The devil's world knows that God promised that to Abraham and his spiritual racial descendants. They know that. And that's a, that's a promise God made to Abraham back in the day. I'm going to give you a piece of real estate for you and your descendants. And it goes all the way from the Euphrates River to the River of Egypt. They've never held that much territory. Israel right now is about the st size of the state of New Jersey. And, and all around them is these enemies. And in the midst of all this, God has established Israel back in the land in fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Oh, and one more. I got to keep my word, don't I? Uh, the Jews are air flighting all of the Jews that are in the Ukraine back to Israel. Bunch of planes. But this fulfills prophecy too because God's going to bring his people back from all the nations where I scattered you on that dark and gloomy day. And the biggest population of them is in these United States. There are more Jews in the United States than there is in Israel. They're going to boil out of here after the rapture. And they're going to come home. That's going to happen. But since in my lifetime... 
Jews have come back from all kinds of, of nations around. Asian Jews. I saw was in an Asian Jewish restaurant. Sounds strange, doesn't it? Spanish Jews. Ethiopian. They look like regular Ethiopians, which typically are tall and slender. Russian Jews. Of course, European, British, and I ran into some American Jews over there. They're being brought back from all the nations and being reestablished in that land. Not that every last Jew on earth will be in Israel by the second advent, uh, but during the trip, but a big percentage of them are. It's a, it's a, it, it, they went out into the nations. They took on the racial characteristics of the nations, but they're still Jews. Thank you, Father, for the time together. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us in Christ's name.